This episode is sponsored by Free Market Kids. Join the league of families who are transforming family time into unforgettable Bitcoin learning experiences. With our Hoddle Up Bitcoin mining board game, you're not just playing. You're building bridges, creating memories, and unlocking the brilliance of the future one block at a time. I bought Bitcoin. I didn't know what I bought, but I was so happy. Finally, I'm going to be rich. But two days later, the bubble burst it. I'm like, what? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> I knew it. It's a scam. And I cursed myself for a few days. But then I thought, I really have to figure this thing out. Otherwise, I will be scammed again in the same city. So that's when I finally took the time to research about Bitcoin. Hey everybody, welcome to Orange Hatter. I've got a very exciting announcement to make today. The website for the Orange Hatter Retreat is up and registration is now open. We are offering a 21% discount for anyone who registers by January 30th, 2024. We did have to move the retreat up by one day, so it will run from March 16th through the 20th in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico. This is in partnership with Project Yucatan. It's going to be an amazing five days of recharge, restoration, and deep connections with women Bitcoiners. It will be an absolutely incredible chance to meet like-minded women and form friendships that will last a lifetime. Please go to the website www.orangehatter.com slash Yucatan, and I will see you in Mexico. And now on to our very wonderful guest. Enjoy. Welcome to Orange Hatter. I'm so excited to have you here. I can't wait to dive in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, good to be on the show hosted by our fellow women. <laughs> yes, definitely. Woman to woman conversation. All right. So I know the audience can see this, but we are very casual here. I am literally sitting with a coat on and my blanket on my legs because I'm in the basement talking to Tariko over a cup of coffee. We want this story to be very relatable to you. So yeah, let's get right to it. Tariko, okay. so tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so my name is Tariko. Now I'm working with a Bitcoin company for over four or five years already. But before that, while well, people see me as a free spirit, I like to be free or like I like to have like options. I value flexibility. And then I'm not afraid of changes. Like I'm a risk taker. So my life has took like big turns several times. Growing up, I was born and raised in Japan, but the typical Japanese, not like me. So I am usually I'm the like loud one. I'm like, really spontaneous. I ask questions at school. So teachers are like, you know, it's so rude to question me like at class. <laughs> and then I but I can't help it, right? Because I'm so curious. So yeah, that was like me growing up, but my family is very supportive of me being kind of weird, funny, or like uh, free and independent personality. So I was quite lucky. And then, so naturally, I was interested in the world outside of Japan. So as soon as I get to college, I start traveling around the world. So far, I've probably visited more than 70 countries, but I stopped counting up of 50 countries, so I don't know exactly. <laughs> but uh, I did, yeah, like backpacking Europe. I did really like sort of like five-star hotel type of uh, traveling too. But so my college dates were like those traveling dates. But then you graduate college and you have to start working. <laughs> so my first job was because I loved traveling so much. So I wanted to be in the industry, which I can also travel. So naturally, I chose a travel agency <laughs> so I can be a tour guide. But that was a big mistake. <laughs> if you love something, you should keep it as a hobby, not make it a work. 
because you don't work, because you do something you don't want, you suffer. That's why you get compensated. <laughs> so the first lesson I learned that so, you know pressure in uh, work, but uh, yeah, so I couldn't last long, and then I quit, and then I was so afraid of telling my parents I quit my job after like two weeks. So I'm like I have to find a new job before I come you know clean to my parents. <laughs> yeah, I was like and anything. Just you know, job. I need a job. <laughs> so then I like I was like going through uh, like jobs uh, posting site and blah blah blah, and I found that this new job, which was like a law firm, I was just a legal assistant. And then there I was hired as a legal assistant, but I found out that there were it was back in like um, late nineties, so. Everyone had a PC, everyone had a emails, but that office or maybe law industry overall wasn't digitalized at all. And then I had to like go to the warehouse and then pick up the files from the pile of, of files, right? So I'm like, why do I have to do this? If they have a database, I know exactly where the information they are looking for. So I'm like, going to the partner and then complained about my job being inefficient because of this manual work, right? And then he was like, what can, what can I do? I mean, you know, what do you want to do? So I'm like, I want to build database, even though I had no experience, right? But already Microsoft had a, was it Access, which is the software you can actually build customized the database, even though you don't have a coding skills. So yeah, even though I was hired as a legal assistant, I kind of pivoted myself to this database project, like it's my personal project. So it was funny. So I still had to work as a legal assistant during the day. But after the work, I could work on my own project. And then they could, they, at first, they were not going to pay me for my own project because that's something I just wanted to do. But so it took me almost like six months to like eight months to complete. Like I literally uploaded all the files, the information, at least the index work to the database and then I automated the reporting system. So we don't have to manually write the monthly or like weekly update to our clients. So even though I spent six to eight months on that, the time saving I got afterward that we have to make this was huge. And the partners saw the benefit so eventually they actually paid me to buy that um, database from me. So that was very, it was exciting. It was something I did by myself and then I actually made money. <laughs> and then whole process, I actually enjoyed a lot. It was, everything was new to me. And then I had to go to a bookstore, look for something I can use. And then also I was going to this forum asking questions. I want to make this, I need this function. How can I get it? And the people were so nice that you know, we just do this, this. And yeah, so that was my, I would say that was my first encounter with technology, software. So I got really, interested into that area of the business. So I decided to quit the law firm and then went back to school. So I went back for master degree in the US. Because at that point I thought, okay, maybe I could do simple coding and programming, but I'm not good at it. So I wanted to be more like IT consultants. So I went back to business to business school to get my MBA. And then, yeah, business school was fun. It was busy and it was um, all that stuff. But um, after I finished the school, I 
I didn't stay in the US. I came back to Japan and then worked for so worked for Sony, which is kind of IT consumer product company. And then that product I was assigned was yeah, it was IT. It was like an iPhone without cell phone. <laughs> so it's like everything you can do. Like you can take a picture, you can listen to the music. It's just you can't talk. It's not my phone. I got stuff. Yeah, it was also fun. I was in like product planning, like marketing. But because it's Sony, it's a big company, everything was so slow. And then whatever you want to do, you have to fill the forms. Paperwork was killing me. <laughs> and then the person who value flexibility and the freedom couldn't take it. <laughs> so much structures you have to follow and then like, oh, just kill me. <laughs> so I left after two years. And then after that, I was pretty much on my own. I started my online business. At one point, I was doing fashion and shopper. And after that, I was full-time Airbnb host because I loved traveling, right? And then I stayed Airbnb all over the world. And then I'm like, why don't I just start Airbnb? So even though, even when I'm in Japan, I feel like I'm traveling. <laughs> so I did that for five years, I think. Yeah. So I was like, really, yeah. I'm like the post on foods. Get, like I'm curious, so I always can find something to distract me, like for a year or two, and then I really dig in deep into it. But then I'm like, okay, I'm done. Something new. I need something new. So yeah, I was changing the jobs every like, three, four years, and then I was enjoying that kind of life. That was that was pretty much my pre-Bitcoin days. I find it very fascinating that you are so not the typical Japanese woman that people think of. So I want to dig a little deeper into your childhood because Japan is, is kind of interesting because you have simultaneously the, the very rich and very deep traditions of honor and respect and structure. And then you're also at the cutting edge of innovation. When you were growing up, and being curious and asking questions when you're not supposed to. <laughs> I'm really glad to hear that your parents supported you, but what was it like for you as a student in the Japanese school system with your personality? With my personality, because, because I'm like super social. If I go somewhere, I usually dominate this you know, <laughs> place. Like, I'm like, you know, yeah, I can do this. I can do that. So luckily, I was also well accepted by friends, class two. I was never picked on. I guess I was too strong to be picked on. <laughs> yeah, I was always class president or something like that. People usually don't like to be in that role. And then like, yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. <laughs> so in a way... Because I ask questions I'm not supposed to. So teachers are kind of annoyed. But at the same time, because I born here to be a class president, so they also valued to be kind of, you know, spontaneous and then take actually responsibility. How was that like when you were going through the testing phase of entering higher education? Oh, like specifically study for college entrance examination and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, that was tough because you have no flexibility. There is only one answer, right? It's usually a multiple choices. So, but I have a good memory, so I could memorize a lot of stuff. So I did okay. Yeah. The tough part is you actually have to, so you have, you can train yourself to do good in that kind of test, testing, right? So junior high and high school, because I had to go to this cram school, especially tailored for scoring high on that kind of test. So that wasn't fun. And then that consumed my precious free time. So I didn't get up all. Yeah, but 
I knew already that that's something I have to go through to be in a place I want to be. So, yeah. Okay, so you get through the testing phase and now you're at, at、uh, the university and you said that you actually traveled a lot during your university years. So, were they yeah, travel、so、abroad it, programs or were they just vacation kind of trips? It's vacation type of a trip, but Japanese、uh, educational system is different. From the US, I think.、Um, so, up until high school, their whole purpose for students a r e getting into good university. And once you get into university, like, unlike the, in the US, you actually have to work really hard in the university, right, to get the grade or just to graduate. But Japan is not like that. Once you are in, you will be. Graduating, even though you don't have to do any work. So, <laughs> in my case, yes, I was I w a student at the university, but I didn't really go to classes. I didn't attend classes. And then professors are also lazy too. So, they, used, they reused the same test over and over for many years. So, I could just get the test in advance from a friend who's already been through the same class. So, yeah, literally, you can graduate without studying in Japan. So,、uh, instead of going to classes, I actually started working. It's a part time job, but I was almost working as a full timer. <laughs> Like, I was working eight and hours a day to save money for traveling. Yeah, so I work and they save up their fun. Then, once I have enough, I just took off, even though school are in. It wasn't even summer break or spring break. I just, whenever I had money, then I just took off. <laughs> okay, so the four years that you were in college, you were actually. Not doing college work at all. It was、no. in name only.、Mm-hmm. And you literally yeah, took off、so、in the middle、I、of the was, school year.、Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I was supposed to study economics and then I have a bachelor degree in economics. But、uh, yeah, I, I didn't learn much about economics. But luckily it was Keynesian. So thank God I didn't. Land King j e a n s That's too funny. <laughs> okay. And, and I guess that's just the general understanding of all, all Japanese. It's just that you, you basically complete your education by high school graduation, and then the four years of college is the reward that you, you get. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a moratorium you get before facing the t o u g h reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Four years of vacations. But I think nowadays it's, it's a bit different because my niece actually g o to school every day and then you know, start even have a homework, doing a homework at home. So maybe they changed. <laughs> well, here's my question then. Do you think that the education that you experienced through world traveling was? Far more valuable than maybe a classroom experience where you, you get the professors lecturing you and you have to write papers. I don't know because I didn't go that way, right? I couldn't really compare which I didn't experience. But I would say, I don't know, like educational wise, but the traveling definitely influenced me a lot. They, Made my personality or they affected my value and my perspective. Because, you know, born and raised in Japan, it's a clean country. Everything works and then people are so nice. It's very different from the rest of the world, right? So when you go out, you meet people who are not that nice, who are trying to scam you or like, You go to a country which is not clean and you don't even want to use bathroom, but people are using bathrooms. I'm like, how can they? <laughs> like, you know, yeah, like everything. Because 
back then, Japan was having bubble economy. Japan was like number one economic power in the world. So like everywhere I go, I felt like ah, everything is so cheap, right? So yeah, those things you wouldn't know unless you would actually go out and see yourself. And then also because I was doing backpacking and then staying at a used hostel with total strangers, you get to talk to those people, right? And then people who are almost like same age as me went through a lot already. One guy was saying, yeah, my father was a judge at a Supreme Court, but he was assassinated. What? <laughs> and then girls were saying, yeah, my country is so poor. And then I'm the first one who went to college. And what? People don't go to college? <laughs> you know, it's both type of stuff. And then on the other hand, you will have loyal family who has made, who has five cars, and then they have all different work, right? So it's like, I'm like, wow the world it's so big I know nothing about <laughs> I was humbled by yeah those experiences I guess okay so you you've traveled the world you've met all these different people and you've seen different things you return to Japan now you're looking at what you grew up with with fresh eyes how did that affect you when you were looking for a job because you have mentioned in the previous conversation that the culture was changing right around that time, especially where women were choosing not to start a family and not to be boxed in that role of being a uh, wife and mom. Did that mm-hmm. contribute to your viewpoint when you went back to Japan and you started working? Yes. So, yeah, I think women in late 20 or even 30s, they have, it's difficult, right? Because you have to decide if you want to get married, if you want to have kids, if you want to start a family, where you want to live, tough decisions you have to make. And then that decision will actually be done the rest of your life. So you'll be, of course, you'll be afraid of making big decisions, right? But now when I look back, you suffer because you actually have a lot of options. But as you get older, your options are, it's one by one, it disappears. At a certain age, you cannot have child. So like less, one less thing to worry about, right? So, but of course, when you are late 20s or 30, you don't know that. So I was, yeah, I was going through tough time, especially around 30. That's when I graduated from business school too. The timing wise, I could have married and started family, but then my degree, MBA degree, would be just wasted. Because in Japan, it's either or. If you choose career, you pretty much have to give up on um, marriage and then having family. And then if you want to have family, then you have to sacrifice your career. And then I'm like, I just spent two years and there's so much money on my education. I can't just give up. <laughs> I have to repay, like I have a huge debt, I have to work. (laughs) Yeah, and then also, yeah, because I grew up in the culture, I knew what what, what would be like if I get married to typical Japanese men, which I wanted to avoid. So, yeah, even my mom, who's been married, happily married for many years, and then my parents are really good, and then I grew up in a good family, but even she said, don't get married to me because she knew I could actually support myself financially and then I'm strong enough to be living myself. Um, so she said, you are not going to be happy to have that normal, like typical Japanese wife life. So yeah, stay away. I'm just so blown away by how supportive your parents are. That's amazing. <laughs> To not have that burden, because if they had said, no, what's wrong with you? Why why won't you do the typical thing? I think that would have been very difficult for you to kind of break out of the mold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm just lucky, I guess, because I know a lot of my friends who went to you know, school with 
Yeah, they definitely have pressure from parents. And then also, you know, peer pressure too. Everybody, my close friends were like married young and then starting to have kids. Am I really going to be by myself? Am I going to be okay? I questioned myself, but I just couldn't give up my freedom. <laughs> freedom, it's really important to me. That's, That's, I mean, yeah, go ahead. eventually to make someone else happy, then you have to be happy yourself too, right? Absolutely. To have, yeah, I realized I wouldn't be happy if I tied me put into this box and then I can't even do anything. How can I make, you know, my kids or my husband happy? I don't think I can. So. Okay. So we've established that you love freedom. I think that's a wonderful segue to get into Bitcoin. You've just quit Sony and now walk us through how you came across Bitcoin. So, I mean, my Bitcoin story is actually really typical. You heard of the word Bitcoin so many years ago, but you couldn't. You didn't care it. You just dismissed it as, yeah, it's, it's a scam. It's a speculation. So you didn't give any time to look into it. So I started hearing about Bitcoin back in 2013, 2014. Because I've been investing in stocks and real estate from college, right? So I've been watching Bloomberg or like CNBC. And then sometimes... Uh, when the Bitcoin price rate, they would report that, like, yeah, Bitcoin just broke uh, $100 or something like that. And then I vividly remember the first time Bitcoin actually broke $100. Yeah, I think that was 2014. So, yeah, but still, I'm like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's tulip bubble. <laughs> it will go down to zero. So I didn't even pay it. But 2017 in bubble, I couldn't just watch the price going up and then making everybody so rich. <laughs> so finally, I bought my first Bitcoin in December 2017 without uh, doing research. So even though I bought Bitcoin, I didn't know what I just bought. But I was so happy. Finally, I'm going to be rich. But two days later, the bubble burst it. And then it, you know, the price crashed to the half. I mean, like, what? <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. It's a scam. I was, you know, run cold. And I was so upset. And I cursed myself for a few days. But then I thought, okay, I really have to figure this thing out. Otherwise, I will be, you know, scammed again in the same scheme. So that's when I finally took time to research about Bitcoin. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to read or who to listen to. So basically, I just Googled and then read all the articles it came out. And then I was like, yeah, see, it's scam. You see, it's scam. <laughs> but then... I found this blog post and then that made me wonder, oh, maybe it's not a scam. Maybe it might be. So the blog post was by BJ Boyapati. It's famous, the bullish case for Bitcoin. I think many of Bitcoiners I think it's a classic. It was written in 2018. It's made into a book now. It's really good book. So he talked about Bitcoin and as a money, and he went back to the history of money and what makes good money. So yeah, to me, what, that was the first article which actually gave explanation in, in terms of like from their economics perspective. Even though I didn't study economics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. This, this seems really legit. So after that, I still continue on reading. And then a few months later, I discovered the Bible. It's called the Bitcoin Standard, which eventually I translated into Japanese. 
So yeah, that book was the slap in the face. You now this it's the world I've been living, the world I thought I knew, but it's totally different story. So I'm like, you know, I want to think about. So that was when I started falling into the rabbit hole. Yeah, literally after that, or like during that time, like 2018, <laughs> you know, my personal view, if I find something interesting, then I, I have to go all in. So that time, I would rather read than eat or sleep. So my mom is like, here we go again. <laughs> Everyone's being terrible. Like she wouldn't eat, she wouldn't sleep, she just read. Yeah, so I was doing it for about a year. I just couldn't stop. I wanted to know everything about Bitcoin. So that was extreme time. Yeah. You know what I find fascinating is that when the price fell, instead of rushing to sell it, you decided to re up on it. Go through that period for me because that's so unusual. Most people will be like, oh my gosh, I made a horrible mistake. I better sell it before it goes to zero. But you didn't do that. You went and studied Yeah, I mean, it, it was already, uh, you know, it was already in a half price. I'm like, at this point, it doesn't really matter, right? And if I hold on to it, or if it goes there, I mean, it's just, I just made a mistake. <laughs> I just have to own the mistake. <laughs> And a lot of people, I think it just, they just don't want to even hear about Bitcoin after going through that experience, right? But I really wanted to make sure that I wouldn't trip on the same scam. I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't allow myself if I fell falling into the same scam. So I really needed to know how this thing worked. That's interesting. Did you do that with other cryptocurrencies? Did you experiment with them? And did you do the same studies into them that you did with Bitcoin? So, yeah, I mean, because two days after I bought Bitcoin, it crashed. So I didn't really have other cryptocurrency at that point. But when I was reading about Bitcoin, of course, you come across other cryptocurrencies too, right? And then because I was back then, looking cryptocurrency as you know almost like same as stocks so i was trying to pick the right one which would outperform others right so yeah i bought several or like tons of auto coins but eventually eventually i realized oh there's a bitcoin it's money it's a good money and then other cryptocurrency it's just a startup stock like the so I could differentiate and then I couldn't care less about those equities. I was more interested in good money and what the good money can do for the society and the whole world. So even though I came for the profit, I just wanted to make money. I stayed because I saw the possibility or the potential of Bitcoin, which can actually change the world for the better. It's interesting that you say the other cryptocurrencies are like equity in a startup company. I haven't heard it described quite that way. So I'm really glad that you use that term because that's what it really is. It's centralized. Yeah, because, yeah, it's, they have, well, I mean, they didn't call the company, but they have what they call themselves like foundation. So it's, it's same, right? It's that they, you have the organization which determines the fate of the blockchain or the cryptocurrency. So it's a company. And then those people who are working on are just members working for that company. And then people who hold the crypto is a shareholders. They get to say what they think, but uh, it's, really up to the company or the management to decide, right? So it's, yeah, it's a startup company. Yeah, it, it sounds like um, it, it was actually really lucky that you bought Bitcoin and two days later it crashed. So that's that was actually a, a huge blessing for you. Okay, so yeah. now you're way down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Give us an idea of how you then transition into working in the Bitcoin space. And then I want to talk a little bit about the Nostaville, Asia that you just came from. Yeah, so when I was uh, reading about Bitcoin, I had so many questions, right? Because I have 
math or technological background. So I started going to meetups to meet Bitcoiners who know about Bitcoin so I can ask questions. And then, of course, when I go to those midpoints, they are all men. And then when I enter the room, they are like, huh, are you lost? <laughs> this is Bitcoin meetups. <laughs> like, are you lost? <laughs> like, are you someone plus one? <laughs> like, I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not plus one. I'm not lost. I'm here for Bitcoin meetups. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> Yeah, so I started going to this meetup, and then at one meetup, there were a group of people who are actually working to create a hardware wallet, made in Japan, like hardware wallet, and then um, they had a prototype. So because I, my background is product planning and marketing in consumer market, right? So I'm like, you, you can't, this is, make this like this, or like, not this color, or this button, it's it's not like this. It has to be this way or something like that. So I was giving irresponsible opinion about <laughs> their product. <laughs> and then they're like, yeah, they are a startup. And then basically, town now, they were still working for university. They are professors at Stanford professors. So they were like cryptographers. So no, nothing about business. I'm like, are you going to be okay? Like, you don't know anything about business. Like, even though you come out with really good product, you have to deliver that product to the market. Otherwise, they would not even know this exists. So you need a marketing person, you need a communication channel, and then they have no clue. So yeah, I decided to join them. So that was my first Bitcoin job. And I was there for how many? Two, three years. Yeah. So that's how I got started in this industry. That's fascinating. Isn't it so true that the inventor usually is not the best person to bring the product to the marketplace? So you worked for that company for two or three years. Did you transition from that point to where you are now? Or was that there are other yes. steps in between? Uh, no, it was from their startup to the other side of the venture capital. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> startup life is tough. Like, you, yeah, like I really hate it when I had to talk to uh, venture capital. Like, you know, I know them saying no, it's part of their job. It's nothing personal, but still, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> It hurts. And then also the market cycle too. Like Bitcoin has a four year cycle, right? And then when I joined them, it was 2018. So the bubble just bursted. So there, it wasn't a good time to raise money. I mean, it was a good time to build, but you know, I was constantly worried about that, like, you know, runway, like how, how much, how many months do we spend? Like how many months? we go like this yeah it was so stressful yeah so yeah from there i yeah joined to dc so when you started traveling again because i know that you're not in japan right now but when you started traveling mm -hmm. again was that because of the venture capital work that you're doing or is that just a personal interest like i want to continue to see the world kind of thing so now mainly it's for conferences, so it's a part of the job. But even before, like when I was working for the startup, I was traveling mainly to see. I was really fascinated with the uh, idea of Bitcoin circular economies. So I wanted to visit them and then see what they are doing. So I went to um, El Salvador and to Guatemala. Yeah, just out of curiosity, nothing to do with the job. <laughs> As we were talking before, there are circular economies popping up all over the place. I've personally talked to a bunch of women who are with their own effort with the local people trying to start circular economies where they are. It's absolutely incredible the amount of work you have to put into convincing the merchants yeah. to accept Bitcoin. What have you observed yeah. around the world in your work and also out of your personal interest? That you can share with us i mean it could be just the type of people who are working on it or their differences 
Mm, you mean they're specifically about the uh, circular economy or uh, specifically uh, about the circular economy? Uh, yeah. Circular economy. I think there are different ways, like the Bitcoin Beach in El Salvador, El Salvador it's a bottom up, right? So, but it's a bottom up grassroots movement, but they had a funding. They had an anonymous donor who gave them a lot of Bitcoin so they could start distributing Bitcoin to people living in the community. So it's, I would say it's not a typical circular economy. Because nowadays, those you know, other circular economy popping up around the world are started by Bitcoiners who are so into Bitcoin, who want to change the world. So they're actually using their own money and their own time to convince, yeah, like you said, educate merchants and then building necessary tools. So those are the grassroots bottom-up approach. But on the other hand, like Lugano city of Switzerland, where you can actually pay, like you can shop more than 200 stores with Bitcoin, and then you can even pay tax or any city service in Bitcoin. And then, you know, it's very different. It's a top-down approach. So they have budget, and then they can hire a company to make, like, posts to cater their needs. So basically, in Lugano, everybody accepts Bitcoin but because of the way POS is configured, the margin have a choice. Like they can choose how much Bitcoin they want to keep once they keep, once they get Bitcoin. So some might want to just keep 5%, some might want to keep half, some might want to keep all in Bitcoin. But in reality, everybody chose to convert back to switch from as soon as they get Bitcoin. So no more chance wants to hold on to Bitcoin. Yeah, so that's the reality. So yeah, different different types of circular economies. I don't know which one would be good. Top down seems very efficient if you just want to count the stores which accept the Bitcoin, but you know, if you dig in, those people are not really holding on to Bitcoin. So I don't know. Like tax rights, it's probably bottom up will be eventually more effective. Yeah. Wow, that's really helpful. I didn't know there were these different structures. Let's jump quickly to your recent experience, Nostra Asia, and it took place in Japan. So very exciting. Tell us a little mm-hmm. bit about what that was like. So Nostra Asia is a conference about Nostra. Nostra is not part of Bitcoin, but Bitcoiners are very like excited about because uh, Bitcoin is like freedom money, but uh, it's also freedom of speech. Like other social networks, services like Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, there are certain things you shouldn't say, otherwise you will be frozen. But Nostar, it's not really decentralized. It's like uh, you have many servers where you can store your data. So if this one server decided to ban you, there are so many others you can go to. So you would never lose your profile, right? So that kind of freedom of speech would appeal to Bitcoiners. So probably if you see overall, it's probably 90% people who are on Nostar are somewhat related to Bitcoin, if they are Bitcoiners. But in Japan, it's different. Japanese Bitcoiners still hang out in Twitter or X. And not many people are on Nostar. So who's on Nostar? Those are the people who just like new stuff. So they find out, oh, there is this new SMS we have to be on. And then many of them are developers. And then they found out it's so easy to build an app on Nostar. It's so flexible. 
So they enjoy that experience, right? So Nostra Asia, even me, who actually spoke on the stage at Nostra Asia, didn't really use Nostra before Nostra Asia. <laughs> like I had a account for a year already. I'm not active. So I don't know much about Nostra, to be honest. So there are, I would say, oh, we probably had most like 700 people coming to conference over in total. And it was four days long. And then probably 60, 70% of people are visiting Bitcoiners. And then three to 40% of Japanese Nostar users, plus a bit of Bitcoiners. So the talks are very different from what you hear on at uh, Bitcoin conferences, even though people who are speaking are the same. So they are Bitcoiners, but they also are excited about Nostar. So on the stage, they try to focus on Nostar, but they didn't talk much about Bitcoin, which was I think which was good because those Japanese Bitcoiners, no, no star users, are not necessarily Bitcoin fans. Actually, some of them hate Bitcoin. When they found out that, which is like tipping service on Nostra, is using coin technology, they were so disappointed. And then they wanted to make alternative version of tipping function, not using Bitcoin. So they, they hate Bitcoin that much. <laughs> so it was, for me, it was interesting. But I'm like, you know, there are so many Bitcoiners and then you can't avoid talking about Bitcoin. It's a freedom pet, you know, same. And then those people who actually like Nostra because it's free, then they should be interested in Bitcoin if they know what coin is really about. So I try to orange pill uh, Japanese Nostra users during Nostra Asia, but it didn't go well. That it didn't like I couldn't I couldn't orange pill any anyone. <laughs> Why do they hate Bitcoin so much? Because so Japan used to be like Tokyo used to be the center of Bitcoin scene back then, like until like 2017, 80s. You know, Mark Fox was there. CJ, the C, the founder of Binance, lived in Tokyo, and Roger Burwell also you know, in Tokyo. The world's first Bitcoin meetup was created in Tokyo. Everybody was in Tokyo, so it was big. And then, a lot of people bought Bitcoin during, like, at the around the same time as me, so like 2017 bubble. And a lot of people lost money, you know, after a bubble bursted. So they had some like, negative feeling about Bitcoin through that experience. Or people who didn't even buy Bitcoin heard about so many bad things about Bitcoin. Like when Mt. Gox filed bankruptcy, I still remember seeing on national television network saying that the CEO of Bitcoin company was arrested. <laughs> it was just one, I mean, huge, but one exchange. But people couldn't differentiate between Mt. Box and then Bitcoin as an open source network. So, yeah, I guess that image was embedded back then and it's still lingering around in their head. They couldn't shut off. So still, when I talk to Japanese friends or like uniform members. I wouldn't say I work in Bitcoin, but then I have to start experiencing it. So I would just say, yeah, I'm in tech. I'm in fintech. <laughs> Even though we had that bubble burst, eventually the price came back up. But I guess by that time, they weren't really paying too much attention because yeah. they were traumatized so much. Yes. So the last one, 20, was it 2021? Yeah, the price, they reached new all-time high, right? But not many people paid attention. I'm assuming because 
they already dismiss Bitcoin as scam, or some people who secretly wanted to have a Bitcoin so they could enjoy the price pump, but they didn't, so they were kind of bitter about it too. Yeah, I don't know which, but still, yeah. And then even like recently, when price is going up, right? It's not making new old time high, but it's close enough, especially when you look at the chart in Japanese yen, which has depreciated massively in the last few years. So it's so close, but still not many people are talking about it. You also mentioned that in Nostra Asia, the developers really love the zapping mm-hmm. capability of tipping each other. They didn't know what sats were. <laughs> and then they found out that it was operating on a Bitcoin base. Instead of looking to Bitcoin and why it's the base that's on Noster, they created their own version? They tried to. I don't know if they succeeded. But uh, yeah, they talked about how we can go without using Bitcoin network. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, and then even some of them I personally talked during Nostar Asia said, so now they are okay using Lightning Network. So they are like extensively like researching how Lightning Networks work and which is fine. But, and then some of them are even running Lightning Node. So when they say, yeah, I run Lightning Node, I'm like, then you are also running Bitcoin node, but they don't want to do it. And they don't want to say it. And then I wouldn't <laughs> dare to say that. Yeah, I don't know why. But they said, yeah, Lightning Network is cool, but I just don't care about money. Like money is good or not. So I'm not interested in learning about Bitcoin. So would you say that the Bitcoin movement in Japan is not very robust or is it just isolated incidents with these developers? No, no, that's the overall question. Uh, I have a dedicated website, which is just a collection of Japanese Bitcoin educational materials. It's there, but uh, I don't get a lot of traffic. People just don't care about Bitcoin because, I mean, you can probably read it. The US is probably the same. Everything works. People have credit card, people have bank accounts. They have their own payment network and then they get points or discount. I mean, they don't need Bitcoin, which is actually a blessing. So, I mean, if they don't need it, good for you. You are the lucky ones. <laughs> yeah, I just had the same conversation with my son yesterday at the dinner table. And I could see as I was talking, his eyes rolling because he's, just not in that stage of life where it's important yet. He's relatively young. And so, yeah, all we can do is make the material available and hope that one day they will find their own way there. That's also a good thing about Bitcoin, right? It's just there as an option. And then either opt-in or opt-out, it's entirely up to that person. That's freedom. That's flexibility. It's just an option. Ska and I talk a lot about that. All we can do is share the knowledge we have so that people can make informed choices. Because right now I feel like they're making choices, but they don't have the whole picture. Like what you were saying, when you started reading the Bitcoin standard, you realized that everything you knew wasn't true. Everything that you grew up believing wasn't true. So yeah, that's my only goal is just to give people the full picture. Yeah, but I also have to warn people who are going to be entering to Bitcoin that once you see the world through Bitcoin lens, you can't unsee your perspective has changed 180 degrees. And if you wish, you can't go back to the way you were before. So you might do some friends. You'll be in different situations. So... Yeah, because sometimes I'm like, like, can I just go back to happy fiat life? It was so much easier. (laughs) But you can't unsee, so yeah. Well, that's exactly why, yeah, that's exactly why I created that retreat. Because we do see things so differently. And it's frustrating that the rest of the world doesn't see what we see. And that can be really draining. You know, that could be really Mm -hmm. fatiguing. Okay, so to wrap up, what would you say to a woman who's still sitting on the fence about Bitcoin? 
I actually don't have the advice because that's the question I've been always um, asking myself. How can I get more women to Bitcoin? How can I get more women to my like, Bitcoin meetup? Um, and then I actually don't have an answer. So I don't know what's stopping them. I've been hosting uh, Bitcoin meetup in Tokyo for five years. And then usually I'm the only woman there. And then people don't even realize I'm a woman <laughs> because it's just all guys. And you kind of have to blend in too, right? I mean, I'm not trying to be, but I guess I'm by now, I'm like one of them, like I'm like a dude. So I don't know what's blocking women's mind. Um, and I don't know what's their role. One thing, yeah, like you said, women are busy. Right, so much to do. They don't have enough time for themselves. So why they should spend that time on Bitcoin, like studying Bitcoin? And I, I can't, like, I can't shove orange pill into their mouths. Right, they have to realize they have a problem. Once they know they have a problem, then they will start looking for solutions and they might stumble onto Bitcoin. But if they are living in a perfect world, I don't think those people will never discover Bitcoin. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't have the answer. I don't have a good advice. It's so true that until they have a problem they need to solve, they're living their life and it's fine. One idea I have is like the home mm-hmm. parties for selling stuff. So they have it for jewelry. They have it for recipe books. They have it for Tupperware and Bible study and things. And I think there's something to the intimacy of somebody's home that is just different mm-hmm. from a Bitcoin meetup per se. So that's sort of the way that I'm trying to figure out how to get more women to just invite two or three friends to their home and open it up. And then instead of saying, let me tell you about Bitcoin, because then the people won't show up. (laughs) Maybe we say something like, come over and we'll play games. Because people Mm -hmm. still do that. They get together, they play games. That Mm -hmm. hopefully then opens up the conversation. Because we kind of have to do it in a roundabout way. If we just go in, guns blazing, like, Yes. Do you know what is wrong with the fiat system? They're going to be like, oh, you're going to try to yeah, yeah, yeah. preach to me again. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about it because I do see in America, too, that most women are just going about their daily lives. Either they don't need it or they're so busy trying to survive, they don't have time to stop mm. and think of mm. other alternatives. Right, right. That's true, too. Yeah, I think the people who want to reach uh, who needs Bitcoin actually don't have time. It's just they're so busy. So I'm actually starting a podcast uh, next month. And Are you? Good for you. Tell me about I mean, it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's going to be in Japanese. Yeah. And then it's going to be the like hidden agenda is, of course, Bitcoin. But I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> the title Very doesn't sneaky. Bitcoin. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's about it's about money. Like people love money. Yeah. So yeah. it's about money. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this podcast is actually based on that we use. Do you know the my first Bitcoin, the El Salvador? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we eventually gonna translate that textbook into Japanese, but it's such a big book. It's gonna take time. So. In the meantime, we're going to start this podcast. It's going to be just 15 minutes once a week. We're going to update once a week. So it's not overwhelming at all. Mm-hmm. And then we just go through the textbook bit by bit. It's basically me and then other guy. So the other guy is like a newbie. He's, he just got a big one. So he asked me questions and then I answer kind of thing. And then we try not to use the word Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah we got to do yeah. it all different ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we just have to yeah. hide our intention. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was talking to... Alert. I know. I was talking to uh, Rachel Geyer in Germany. 
And、mm-hmm. she was saying how if we were to have a wellness retreat, and we don't say、mm-hmm. Bitcoin retreat, we just say wellness retreat, women would flock to it because everybody's about wellness. And then once they arrive, then you say, well, there's different kinds of wellness. You have your health wellness, you have your emotional wellness. And oh, by the way, you have your financial wellness. Let's talk about Bitcoin. But of course, we want to cover all the other areas. So, in that way, you can attract newbies in and have a way to connect the ideas together. So, I'm like, oh, that's very sneaky, but I think it might work, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I think we have to be sneaky. <laughs> we have to be sneaky. I know. I just think that women have a lot of power to influence through the home, like through the living room. I always keep going, going back to the living room. So, I just feel like we have a lot of power and we're just starting to collectively work together because the men have been working together for over a decade. And so I feel like their network is really strong, but the women are literally just starting to step forward. So, as much as I can, I want to try to get us together face to face and not necessarily to talk about what's going on in technology or even politically, but just. How do we communicate to other women in the way that only women can to spread the idea?、Mm-hmm. And when you, if you listen to some of the men talk, they would say, if things get bad, we're just going to leave. I'm going to pick up my family, we're going to leave. Well, that's great for you, but what about the rest of us who can't just pick up and leave? You know, my kids aren't <laughs> going to come with us. I have to stay here. We got to fight the battle here. And the only way that I know how is to get women to work the women's network. Do you know, I don't know if you guys have this in Japan, but there's an organization called MAD, M A D D, and it's Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It's a coordination started、mm-hmm. by a mom of somebody who was killed by a drunk、mm-hmm. driver, and it's a bottom up grassroots kind of movement against drunk driving. Mops is another one, Mothers of Preschoolers. That's a very, very strong network. And, and there are Mops organizations everywhere. You can't go to a city in the US and not be able to find several Mops groups. So, kind of like that, if we can do something through the home like that for money education, maybe not even Bitcoin education, but just money education. Yeah, money in general. Yeah, yeah then, then we have a chance to spread the wildfire, you know? That's my thought. Yeah. But、uh, yeah, I think in general, especially in the last few years, or like last year, this year, people are suffering from inflation. And then many people are wondering why we have to suffer, right? We are working at the same time. Time and we are getting, even we are getting great, but somehow your life is much more difficult that you can't even keep up with bills. So people are、like、starting to question why. People just haven't found what's causing. But yeah, so I guess now is the time why they just stick to the good. Joining us today, if the discussion with our guest resonated with you and you would like to dive deeper into the world of Bitcoin, don't miss out on joining the Orange Hatter Women's Reading Club. The meetup link is in the show notes. Also, if there are women in your life whom you think would both enjoy and benefit from learning more about Bitcoin, please share Orange Hatter with them. Until next time, bye! This episode is sponsored by Free Market Kids.